Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 134, and I sat down here in Nashville with Vanessa Landino, and she is the uh, owner and operator of <laughs> Cast Iron Counseling. She's a therapist here in town in Nashville, and she is a wonderful human. Uh, it was really uh, great chatting with her. We covered a lot of stuff, covered a lot of ground. I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, usual stuff, heyhumanpodcast.com. Uh, it's got great links and information about my guests. Uh, there's also an Amazon affiliate portal there on the front page of heyhumanpodcast.com. You click on that and you do your shopping as normal and it helps support Hey Human. And tis the season for lots of shopping. So if you're going to be shopping on Amazon anyway and you want to help support Hey Human, please do your shopping through that portal. That would be awesome. Hey Human Podcast on Facebook, Instagram. You can email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. Uh, I updated the website. There's some changes on there that my dear friend, Ren Renfrey, try saying that five times really fast, from A Ren Creative has helped me do. Uh, and when I say it helps me, I mean, I sat there and said, I'd like this. And he went, okay. And he did it. But, you know, here we are. Um, yeah, so check that out. I'm very excited about those changes. It's subtle here and there, but there's stuff on there. Um, and what else? Um, I think really that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks for listening. That's important to say. And I uh, hope everybody is, uh, is doing well. It's that time of year where things get kind of dicey emotionally for a lot of people. And uh, just want you to know that I'm, I'm on your side and I'm out here and I love you and I appreciate you and, you know, we're all in this together. So tarry on, as they say. Nobody says that. I think I watch too much British television. <laughs> All right, everyone. Here we go. Vanessa, welcome to Hey Human. Hi, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Good. Yeah, good. I'm good. Um, we just met. Mm -hmm. uh, you were sitting on a panel for a mental health mm -hmm. lecture. Yeah. Um, I'm not actually sure... Who the official sponsor of that? Was it the Musicians Alliance? Or? Yeah, it's called Music Health Alliance. Music Health Alliance, mm -hmm. yeah, which looks like a really good group of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah they do good work. Yeah, I, I love going to uh, mental health forum type panels. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating, especially because everyone has a different perception of mental health mm -hmm. and certainly advocates for awareness of mental health mm -hmm. are on a spectrum of like, Let's devilify it. Let's mm -hmm. <laughs> talk about it. There's all these different things. But there were particularly things that you said that really uh, piqued my interest, mm -hmm. which is why I wanted you on the show. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let's start, um, kind of go backwards a little bit. Okay. What's your background and how did you tumble into your profession? Yeah, it's a tumbling for sure. <laughs> yeah. I remember being in grad school and um, a professor from another university was guest lecturing and he said something that I'll never forget. He said, you know, no one thinks as a child, I want to grow up and be a therapist. Um, it's something that comes, I think, it's born out of suffering. And I suffered and grew up in New Jersey. Um, my mom was an immigrant. She came here from Colombia. And uh, my dad was a first-generation Italian. So they were used to struggling to create a life for themselves and their family and their siblings and parents struggled to create a life. Mm -hmm. So what I was raised with was a really kind of innate assumed sense of struggling and overcoming. What I didn't get was um, the tenderness and the slowed down attunement to my emotional life um, that all children need. Mm -hmm. um, did you have siblings that you grew yep. up with? I'm yeah. the youngest of four. We're four girls. <laughs> and yeah, the both both cultures that comprised um, our family, they're both really strong 
cultures. They um, and female centric, are they not? They are. They're matriarchal. Yeah. So the women in my family, my sisters and I have laughed about this for a long time, but we can't really find a weak one. We can't find, you know, one that didn't have her voice. In other words, we just come from two lines of extremely strong, opinionated fighter sort of women. What are the? I'm just. What are the? Um, what are the men like in the family then? That's if a in a in a matriarchal society, what happens to the men? It's a really complex question, <laughs> um, and I'm not sure I have a great answer. But what I will say is um, there was a lot of passivity. Mm. Um, there was a lot of characteristic coupling of the opinionated, emotional, ex emotionally expressive woman and the passive intellectual male. Um, there was also a ton of addiction in my family system on my dad's side. So there was a lot of drug abuse and alcoholism just going back generations. Through the men, you mean, or through Both everyone? Sides. Both sides. Okay. Lots of addiction on that side. On my mom's side, there was a lot of militant religiosity, mm -hmm. which basically does the same thing. Both are meant to medicate emotion. Um, and Ooh, so That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting. We, we all have very crafty ways of medicating our emotions. Some receive more accolades than others. So if I'm very religious, people think, oh, she's such a spiritual woman, but I'm still not feeling a thing because, you know, God is in control. Well, because you've given yourself up to a higher, yeah, right. Well, it's a spiritual bypass, Yeah, right? I don't have to feel feelings because yeah. I'm spiritual. And also, you, you, I think for some, uh, and of course, we never speak in absolutes because that's, an, you know, the absolute thing is right. there are no absolutes. Right, right. Sure. But, uh I think for many people, even the idea of maybe going through an intermediary to get to God, to mm -hmm. have somebody, to know that there's a God force that is creating options and taking away options, it, it allows a person who doesn't really want to be active in their life to let go and not sure. really take responsibility. In a lot of ways, and yeah. And be present yeah. with themselves and themselves in all of their parts, mm -hmm. right? So the the darker parts of me, the shadow, in other words, um, I don't have to pay attention to because it's forgiven, it's mm -hmm. redeemed, and yet mm -hmm. it's with us always and kind of always functioning. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's a, it's a whole it really other is. ball of wax. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So but that was, yeah, that's like sort of the soil that I grew up in. So right. I have a lot of the strengths associated with overcoming. Um, I'm resilient. I'm resourceful. I'm creative. Uh, what I didn't get was the ability to hear my own heart and tend to my own emotions with care. And I didn't really learn how to connect intimately because when life is about survival, there is no intimacy. Mm -hmm. No one has time for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, sort of Maslow did a good amount of work on the hierarchy of needs. But when you're really just trying to survive a really harsh environment, and mm -hmm. for me emotionally, that's what that was, we didn't know how to name our feelings, talk about them. Nobody did. And I think it's important to point out that sex and intimacy are totally different. 100%. That you can have sex without intimacy and vice versa. Sure. So Yeah, intimacy, I mean, it's a huge category. For me as a child, what I think about when I think of intimacy with a child is the ability to be present with that child in a really respectful, honoring, curious way. And to care for their vulnerability, I suppose. They are, by very nature, vulnerable because they're dependent. Um, so, yeah, I sort of grew up as best I could. Um, I went to the Tisch School of the Arts, and I have an undergraduate degree in... I have a BFA, I have a Bachelor's of Fine Arts, and I was in the mm -hmm. arts, which is where we met at that panel. Um, probably why I got pulled into that. <laughs> and worked in the arts for 10 years, and just really was sort of in survival mode. Um, Did you know it at the time? No, but I knew I was miserable. Um, I had moments of great achievement and accomplishment when I would book shows or book gigs and that kind of stuff. Um, but day in and day out, I knew, um, I wasn't relating well. I had sort of turbulent relationships and for whatever reason, I had some sort of awareness around that. Some people never do. Um, I did. And at 23, I called a therapist and got into a really, really good situation with her. And she saved my life. When the time came for me to call her, the message I left that day was, I need someone to call me back soon. I'm afraid I might hurt myself. Mm. So I was crumbling. Interior world was crumbling. Exterior, you never would have known it. 
I was just on a straight trajectory up. Well, good for you for speaking up because I think, yeah. again, there's that vilification of feeling broken or feeling like you can't keep going. Yeah. And to be able to overcome all that outside noise and say, I need help is humongous. Sure. It was big. And no one in my family understood. You know, I was sort of mocked and ridiculed for that for years. It's just, it's sort of an old school kind of traditional family system. Mm. Um, you know, it was referred to as psychobabble, that kind of thing. And then I remember sitting in her office. It was in, uh, she, had, she had an office on 34th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues in New York City. And I could see the Empire State Building out of her window. And I just remember sitting there and looking at the Empire State Building. And I looked at her one day and I said, Mary, do you think I could do what you do? And she said, Vanessa, I think you'd make a marvelous therapist. And it planted a seed, but I wasn't ready to water it yet. Um, and then I look back on my life, and I was sort of always the deep, probing, emotional one in my family. I suppose that's what led me into the arts. But when my sister, you know, I'm the youngest, so my sisters all went to school before I did in college. And she, my sister, Michelle, was a psych major. And I remember grabbing her psychology textbook. I would have been about 12 or 13 years old and sitting in her closet and reading her undergraduate level psych textbook for fun. So this has always been in me. Um, the arts were sort of my family's dream for me. Um, and I fulfilled that for as long as I could handle it and then stepped out. And then I, long story, got to Nashville, went to graduate school here. And the minute I stepped in an office with a client, I just knew I was home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does the family look to that now? Uh, a couple of members of the family, meh, probably one, respects it. Um, I have a I have a tough situation because I'm the youngest. So when you're the youngest daughter out of four girls in a matriarchy, there's no respect. I mean, you're basically the lowest person on the totem pole. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there's a theorist who'd say I probably have an inferiority complex around that. <laughs> I'm sure I do, Adler. Um, but I don't look for it anymore. I think for a long time, I really wanted their respect. And I, I got it. Well, I got their praise when I was accomplishing great things in the arts, because mm -hmm. um, that's easy to praise. And no one else in my family could sing, dance, or act. So I was the only person that did that. But part of how my family system operates is everybody in the family thinks they're an expert. <laughs> so they don't like uh, still that I am in mental health. I think on some levels it's threatening for them. So I don't really bring it up. Um, I don't talk about my career a whole lot with my family. Um, I would imagine that would bleed out into regular life, too, when, like, in dating or your friends. Is that not something that, oh, are you going to analyze me? Or Yeah, I get that <laughs> sometimes. Um, you know, I'm single, so I date. And sometimes on a first date, uh, if somebody hears I'm a therapist, they'll ask me that. Are you analyzing me right now? And my answer is always the same. If I'm not getting paid, I'm not analyzing you. Right. And I try not to analyze my clients too much in that way either. It's just not really human for me to do that. Yeah. Um, it, what doesn't bleed out, um, and th again, this is sort of a lot of my own background. This is why I became a therapist is the situation in my family. While there was a lot of love, there wasn't a lot of nurture. And so I have a very different experience in the world than I do in my family. I'm a different per I'm the same person, but I feel like I get a completely different experience of myself with other people in my life versus my family life and my family life for whatever reason, I'm kind of always the youngest kid, but in my life, um, I feel very respected and seen and get your and shit loved. together yeah <laughs> well sometimes i do sometimes i don't but the people that i pull in close in my life um if if therapy has taught me nothing else it's taught me um what safety feels like in my body mm. and so the people that i pull in very close to me in my life are people with whom i have a feeling of safety and i know what that feels like and i know what danger feels like in me and it took me years to come back in touch with my body and really feel what it feels like to be in the company of someone who's safe so i would say it doesn't bleed out too much into my life i just know when i'm around my family at times and unfortunately you know the holidays are coming up and we all have to think through these things but we have to put our walls up mm -hmm. to a certain extent to be with family because Part of it's just the nature of family, but some families just aren't safe. Just because people are family doesn't mean they're friends. Mm -hmm. You know. So. Yeah, it's interesting what our brain will do for preservation. Sure. My my, for example, I have two older brothers. <laughs> they're much older than I, and when 
we have different we have different memories of growing up in the same family maybe because of the time span <clears throat> but our experiences are so vastly different sure. probably because I'm the girl I'm the youngest just all the different things that yeah, create sure. family dynamics but it's fascinating to me that I can go into my parents house and not see things and my brother can go into my parents house and get triggered by things that he sees and we've ta he and I have talked about it and uh it's kind of like you said there's just a comes a time where your personal safety comes first and so you say I choose not to see that because it's not mine you know that's my sure. parents sure. things yeah it's not my things yeah and it's an it is an interesting way our brain navigates us yeah for sure you know I am never um put it this way, it never ceases to amaze me how complex and sophisticated our survival tactics are. Mm -hmm. um, we don't give children enough credit and probably because we don't give ourselves enough credit when we were children and we don't step back long enough to notice what we did to make sense of our own world and to survive in it. And what's really, really amazing to me about human beings, and it's one of the most resilient qualities about human beings, is that every single thing we develop to get through our lives no matter how great or small the trauma, no matter how um, intense or, you know, loose the difficulty, what we are protecting is our tender, true heart. No one teaches us to do that. It's this rare gem of truth that we all live with that very few of us are conscious of. But that's why we do everything we do in relationship when we are in self-protection mode. Intimacy would be the opposite. You know, I'm, I'm I'm disclosing myself to you. I'm vulnerable in this way, and I'm giving this part to you for mm. you to see and love. Mm -hmm. Self-protection is exactly the opposite. And what we are protecting is this pure treasure of a heart. And so whatever people walk into therapy with, that's sort of like the overarching understanding that I live in, that whatever you've done, good, bad, ugly, you're ashamed of it, you're proud of it, whatever you've done has been in the protection of this gem inside you that is your tender heart that's where you start just understanding that on some level you really love yourself anyway you know do you think that people have a natural inclination to love themselves of course you do oh yeah that's a very optimistic it, 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 in my daily life i find that people start with the self-loathing <laughs> and eventually mm. you can get them to the to the beauty mm -hmm. of themselves Mm. In fact, I just had a Marco Polo this morning with a dear friend of mine who lives in California. Yeah. And she was talking to me uh, from last night, and she was on her bed talking, you know, looking up at the phone. And she said, oh, my face looks fat in this. And, when, and then she went on to talk about stuff. And then when I responded to her, I had just woken up. My eyes were pretty puffy and things. And, mm -hmm. and I said... I, I opened up a thing, I watched hers, and then I said, oh my gosh, I look so puffy, and then I went on to talk. And then somewhere along the way I said, isn't that interesting? I just realized that you started your conversation with some self-loathing, and then I started mine with self-loathing. Yeah. I said, why do we do that to ourselves? Yeah. You know, it's... Yeah, sure. It's interesting that I... And yeah. I've seen it over, and especially... I don't, I don't... I'm not around men so much that I... And I'm certainly not in the bathroom with them, but when I go to the bathroom with groups of girlfriends at a wedding or something, and... And at they, they, first they all compliment each other, mm -hmm. and then they start tearing themselves apart. Mm -hmm. Not the other person, but themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, God, where, where do we learn this? You know, yeah. I know it starts real young. Yeah. Television and, you know, media and all that kind of stuff. But we can. I also think it's part of the human condition to feel shame, mm. which is what we're talking about. And even shame for feeling good about oneself. Sure. That's even... Oh, yeah. Shame is equal opportunity. Oof. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've learned and explored and experienced and talked with a lot of clients about is sometimes the most vulnerable thing, actually most of the time I think, the most vulnerable thing we can do and share with another person is not our failure and it's not our fear, it's our beauty. Mm, I would agree with that. It's extremely dangerous mm. to bring our beauty to another person and to allow them to see the self-love we have. So... It would be interesting to um, be part of a cultural shift there, you know, that we're going to stop apologizing for ourselves all the time and actually lead with beauty. I think it's just safer to lead with shame. I think everybody speaks shame. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody and has it. those who do hold their head up, I think uh, for many of the outside world, they're just waiting for that moment of falling. 
too. We and see it in celebrity all the sure, time, right? Sure. We're waiting for the celebrity to fall off its pedestal. And yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. The, the assumption, too, is that we are um, on a pedestal or we are in a valley. And we need a different metaphor. Mm-hmm. Because if we see ourselves as on pedestals or in valleys, we're always going to feel shame. Because if we're on a pedestal somewhere deep down inside, we may not believe that we really deserve to be there. And then if we're in the valley, we don't think we deserve to be there either. And the truth is we don't deserve to be in either place. We just deserve to be. Mm. You know, and I think that gets into more of sort of an existential place in all of us where I don't have to convince you that I'm good or bad. I can just be with you and be in front of you and you can be with me and whatever happens is okay. You I know? think you nail it right there when you say, you know, I, I I come to you who I am and however you respond to that is on you. I know who I am. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Man, and I, I dip my toes in that water as often as oh, I can, sure. but but it's so easy to feel forget yeah. or to lose that rope you're holding on to yeah and then you tie it around your own neck you know it's oh, just this sure. whole like, oh. sure and then we get you know this gets into a little bit more of um neurochemistry and neurobiology but when we have neural pathways which if we're not familiar with that means um your brain is basically a system of electrical circuits and the more that you do a certain behavior the deeper that neural pathway grooves in so it's sort of like walking from your house to your mailbox along a little, a little dirt track every single day over 15 years. Think about how worn that path would be. That's what neural pathways are like. Mm. So if every day I wake up and I brush my teeth and I brush to the left side of my mouth before the right side, that neural pathway is going to be pretty deep. Unfortunately, neural pathways work for all kinds of behaviors. So if I am in a groove, if I am in literally a habit of self-loathing, If I look at myself in the most negative light, a lot of what um, therapy and honestly really good religion, and there's terrible religion, but there's really good religion too. There's good spiritual practice. What that does is it interrupts neural pathways. And the first experience that people typically have when they try and do something different is fear because it's unfamiliar, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we like the devil we know. Um, And so what I find in myself and in therapeutic work and just in relationships in general is that people are terrified to love themselves. They don't know what they're like. If they actually wake up every day and think, I'm great and I belong here and I'm loved. Um, It's scary. So I think we need people. Why is it so scary? (laughs) Why? It's a good question. (laughs) It's a good question. I think one of the biggest questions we have is, am I lovable? And maybe we're afraid because we're afraid we're wrong. Okay, if I wake up and jump off this cliff of self-confidence and believe that I really am loved, whether it's by this being we call God or the self, which one could argue is really not anything different one from the other. (laughs) Exactly, right? Um, Will anyone agree with me? Will I be alone? There's no greater fear. There's no greater existential threat than aloneness. Which is, I suppose, why religion is so powerful, because you're never alone if you have a higher power. Yes. You know, in theory, there's an integration. Yes. There was a moment of breakthrough for me in therapy um, when... It was kind of a, it's a funny story. It wouldn't seem like that big of a deal, but it was to me. And that's sort of how these things happen. But I had built a relationship with a therapist here in Nashville that I trusted a lot. And we were working through some of the deepest places of trauma that I went through as a kid. And he went on vacation and he was gone or some, he went away and he was gone for like a month. That's a long time. It was. He sort of took like a leave and I think he went to a conference, but there was a vacation involved. But he was gone for a month and he sent me to another therapist for a month because he was like, look, you're like, you know, elbow deep in it. I really want you to continue this work. I trust this person. Go to that person. So I did. But when he came back, I was eager for him to come back and I was eager to tell him about the work I had done while he was gone. And I woke up that morning and I had done quite a bit of emotional work by that time. And I was very well aware of the fact that I was afraid that he no longer loved me. Mm. So in therapeutic language, what we would call is that's transference, right? I was transferring my idea of a father figure onto him and I really wanted his love. And whatever his feelings were for me is not really the point. But the point was I felt loved by him and I was afraid that he had forgotten about me. And I woke up that morning and I went to my bathroom and I looked in the mirror. And for the first time in my life, 
I looked in the mirror and I looked in my brown eyes and I said, it doesn't matter if he does. I love you. Mm. And something in me just closed and healed that morning. I felt it in my body. It was like, whew, it just came together. And that rift has never been opened again. I think that's the fear. Can I love myself well? Do, are you in a constant state of that then? Have you <laughs> crossed the Rubicon? <laughs> It's a slow process. Um, I will say that I haven't felt that level of dependence in mm -hmm. therapy since then. Um, I do believe something in me kind of closed up and healed that day that thankfully hasn't been re-injured or opened up again. Um, but I'm also, you know, living a life that's different. I don't expose myself to lots of traumatizing situations as much as I can help it yeah um which but I will, some people seek out obviously well that, that that's where the neural pathways are mm. right if I know how to function in trauma and my whole wheelhouse is developed around struggle and fighting for myself and pushing people away and then pulling them back in and pushing them away I mean we get into these kinds of dramas in relationship and a lot of times when people come to therapy they have so much shame around it and when we just talk about, hey, these are the neural pathways that are in place, like in a, in a way you're kind of a slave to them. Mm. So let's bring some awareness to that so that you have more choices and you can make different choices. I think it alleviates some of the shame. We're all really normal. Mm -hmm. We're all really normal, adaptive people just trying to like function in our environment. We also intellectually know this stuff, which is also weird. They, on Facebook is a great example when it's not, you know, arguing politic. There's moments of these, you know, you see the memes and the posts of people saying, um, be kind to each other because we're all, we well, don't know what battle we're all fighting. Sure. And we all know this. Sure. It's intellectually. It's that, that, yeah. that crossing again to, to get from the intellectual knowledge to the really integrational that's knowledge. Right. I don't know. I'm making oh, up words. Oh, no, that's but, beautiful. But yeah, it's, I love that. you know, it's like, yeah. how, why is that? Fissure so great. Sure. Yeah, you know, it's a, it, it's a big it's a big stream that we're jumping into, and I love it. Um, so somebody said, and I have no idea who said it, that the greatest distance you'll ever travel in your life is the eighteen inches from your head to your heart. <sighs> love that. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're talking about, right? And I love the word integrational um, that you just used. There's this idea that um, what you know unfortunately, will not affect that much what you do. You have to get <laughs> Amen, it. Amen, sister. That's right. You have to get it in the body. Yeah. But knowledge is an important step, right? So that's why when children are loved really well, and in a lot of ways I was, I mean, but, you know, nobody does it perfectly. But when children are loved really well emotionally, what winds up happening is before they have an intellectual understanding of what they've been given, they know what it feels like to be safe in their bodies, that's the knowledge we want. We want body knowledge where it's not just intellectual. It's in the body. I know where safety feels like in my body. I know where shame feels. I, I know where abandonment sits in this body of mine. Right. Yeah. When you can get to that point, you're actually living life in a much more awake, alive place because things that are happening to you, you know, there's different levels of um, both interaction and human experience. What we have on the highest level is narrative. Um, and that's unfortunately, and I can't do this for the life of me, but I love those of you who can, I can't small talk. Um, I don't know how I've tried for years. I'm 41. I can't get my hands around it. Um, and Nashville is a town for, you know, that's like, it's people here can shoot the breeze all day long. I'm either bored or anxious. And then I start judging myself. <laughs> I'm like, I just have to get out of this situation. I'm going home. I can't small talk. Um, I'm just like that. Right. I'm You're not good like, at it either. Yeah. Susan's rolling her eyes right I'm now, like, nodding her head. Like, yes, I get yes, it. Yes, you get it. it, right? And that's it's probably awkward. why you and I connected so yeah. easily. Well, so. we immediately dove in, I sure. feel like. Yeah. Well, so what we have is narrative, okay? And the same, the same thing follows in therapy where people are telling me what happened. Okay, what happened in your day? Well, I went to work and then I had this altercation with my boss, blah, blah, blah. Then underneath the narrative, we have the idea of thoughts. Well, what do you think about that? A lot of people stop there, and that's 
what I would call like sort of like the intellectual level is I think, therefore I am. Descartes was wrong, way wrong, okay? But underneath that, we have the emotional level. Well, how does this issue, how does this occurrence, how does that event, that memory, how does it make you feel? And then there's a lot of room there. Okay, where is that in your body? Where do you feel that? That's why they're called feelings. We feel them, mm -hmm. right? That underneath that, we have a spiritual level. What does this mean for me? What does this say about me in the world that this happened to me or that I did this thing or that I am this person? There's a larger connection to the greater whole, right? We don't know how to descend into those layers. So we stay on the thought layer because it's really safe. Again, everything is about protecting that tender heart. Everything is about protecting the core, the true self. So we have this real intellectual layer because it sounds good. And we're safe in it. I mean, it's much easier to disagree than to feel hurt. Mm -hmm. It's a safer layer. And when we offer up our pain, their, yeah. their reaction to that is fascinating. Yes. A lot of times people immediately turn to the defensive, yes. the opposite person. Yes. And get yes. the, and maybe it, it gets volatile because they get mad that they feel that you are offended sure. or hurt or whatever. Sure. Which is also a fascinating response yeah. to that. But that's you know, a safety zone, too. Anger is sure. much safer than pain. It's strong. But same, it's exactly, in my opinion, the same thing. Anger is pain. That's the same thing. It's just, it's, a, it's, it's like that gradient. Sure. Sure. And I will, you know, confession time, I lived a lot of my life, honestly, until very recently in a very bundled state of anger. And here's what I mean by that. There were a lot of emotions going on underneath me. Um, and I didn't know how to talk about them. And here's sort of the wounded healer coming clean, right? I talk with people all day long about their emotions and I talk about them. But it's sort of that classic thing where you can see someone else do it and you've got a lot of perspective on them. But in my own life, I was really struggling with just saying, hey, I feel blank. Can we talk about that? I had lots of defense mechanisms. Um, and in my world, again, because of how I was raised and the people that raised me, it came out as criticism, shaming, judging, critical thoughts, critical words, mm -hmm. dismissal, disgust. I mean, I had all kinds of ways of moving myself away from the person with whom I was having the difficult emotion. And the bundle that I put around all of those behaviors was anger. So through extremely difficult work, I teased all of that apart and then got down to some core wounds. Um, what happened? Where was I hurt? Where's the scene of the crime? You know, I was in New York um, during September 11th and I remember going to Ground Zero and I volunteered there one night and nobody talked. It was quiet and the building was still smoldering and you knew what everyone was looking for in the remains. And we were serving firemen all night long. Um, all, it was one of the coolest actually scenes I've ever seen in my life, but all of these five star chefs and restaurants, like the best in the world came together and set up the tents of Ground Zero. And they were serving these firemen like the most amazing food and the police officers and the first responders and all of them all night long. I mean, for weeks and weeks and weeks, all day long, all night long. It was amazing to watch. and It was amazing to be a part of it. But I remember the sacredness of that time and the quietness at Ground Zero. And when I'm in therapy with someone and we're working through their trauma, their wounds, wherever that defense mechanism was born, there is a wound. And what I usually will say to my clients is when we're, when we're there, when we're getting to the wound, we're on holy ground. And there usually is more silence in the room because we're getting to where your true heart went under. And that to me, I mean, I could cry. Yeah, that. me too. That to me is why I do therapy because I want to go down there with you and say, I see what happened. And your own pain from your own childhood, oh, yeah. of course, it's it's really true that you, the pain of the world can be held sacred by those who have felt the pain of the world. Yes. There's that understanding. Yes. Even if it's a different scenario. Yes. That pain. Yes. Just like love, just like everything, you can't understand that until you yourself. Yes. Have truly felt it. Yes. That's true empathy. It is true empathy. And, 
you know, when people are looking for a therapist, um, and this is such a bigger conversation than just therapy, but psychotherapy happens to be really an art where we talk about these things and we live in these truths quite a bit. Um, but therapy, and I tell my clients this all the time, it's not the only way to heal. It is mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. um, look for someone who's done their work. Look for someone who's done their work. Look for someone who's, who understands their own story deeply. That this is how, these things happened to me. Here's how they affected me. Here are the behaviors that I developed to survive this. That kind of fluidity with one's own story and one's own life honestly alleviates so much shame, not only in the clinician, but in the room, because I don't have to hide in fear about what I've done, because honestly, I understand why. Mm -hmm. And I understand, okay, look, here's the basic human need. We don't really have that many at the core of us. We need to be affirmed and accepted and loved and we need to belong and we need to feel safe. We need to feel seen, right? What we do to meet those needs is called life, right? And so there are healthy ways to meet needs, okay? So if I really have a human need for intimacy, which is part of being a human, it's how we're it's just how we're built. We're social animals. We are extremely wired for intimacy like no other animal, really. If I go about that by trying to have um, sort of uh, meaningless in the sense that like it's not really meeting the need for intimacy, but it's still it's coming close. Sexual liaisons, for example. Right. And that's giving me a lot of, you know, kind of thinking of an example right now, but let's say that's giving somebody a lot of anxiety about their lives. Like, you know, I'm, I keep having partner after partner after partner, but I'm really not scratching the itch and I'm not getting, but there's a lot of shame there depending on their, their system and where they come from. They may have a lot of shame about their, for example, their sexual life. What we have to stop doing is looking at the behavior. The behavior is relevant in that it has consequences and it may create pain or, or, or joy. But what's really important to look at is the need. And that's where a lot of the work of therapy lies is like, you got to get past your behavior and put it over here, put it, put it against the wall. We'll come back to it. If you really need to feel ashamed of it, I promise you, we can come back to shame. But for the next 45 minutes, let's put this over here and let's move into a place of curiosity about yourself. What were you after? What did you really want? Mm -hmm. That's where your humanity is. Mm -hmm. It's in your desire. It's in that core need inside you, right? So maybe you made this decision and it wasn't the best decision. And you kind of came close to what you're really looking for, but it's not quite there. Now let's talk about how to get that met in a healthy way. And can you forgive yourself for the ways that you did it in an unhealthy way? Mm -hmm. I think so much self-loathing is rooted in a lack of understanding of oneself, a lack of compassion for oneself, and no self-forgiveness. Let it go. You're a human. Mm. Yeah, I think many keep the cat of nine tail quite handy. Yeah. That self, Just in case we need the flogging. Yeah, that's right. The self flogging. Um, and I, I think uh, about that kind of stuff that, you know, you go back it, when you're feeling a thing or not feeling a thing and, and you stop for a second and say, where did I first feel or not feel this thing? Right. And try and go back as far as you can that's remember. Great. And then. For me, my practice is then to say, okay, little me, because it was likely childhood something. Mm -hmm. It's generally childhood something. Mm -hmm. Little me, you know, what's going on here? Wh why, are you, why are you responding, adult me responding? How is that correlating? Yeah. And it's really interesting that the conversations... Oh, yeah. And every time I do that, I have this practice in my mind. It's like, it's my own little mind castle. I have a couch... And uh, this started, I mean, I did. I love that, a mind castle. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> but I, I did, when I left, uh, when I got home, after college, I left home for college. Um, it was just a perfect thing. My grandfather passed away and left me and my brother's money. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I was able to really move out and go. Wonderful. Go away. Yeah. Which is wonderful. And, um, and then after college, I still was there. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it, so that's when I started therapy. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a therapist that, that sort of 
taught me that thing about going back to feel the first time you felt something. Yeah. So anyway, for my mind castle, there's yeah. this giant couch. It's very long. It gets longer all the time. Yep. And uh, whenever I go back and meet one of me as a little me over the course of my life, and sometimes they're a little bit older or whatever, I then have the conversation and then bring them into the couch. And then all Beautiful. these little me's are sitting on this couch. We're Beautiful. all, and I know it's, it sounds insane. We all are watching a movie and we've all got popcorn. I love it. And like, I could, if I close my eyes, I can picture some of us, you know, like one of me, I've got a monster suit on. I, I came to the, to the party with a monster suit, yeah. which of course is likely my little me being defensive, trying sure. to protect myself. You got it. But there's all these different characters characterizations mm -hmm. there's the word yep. um and there's something very lovely about this group of yes. me's yes i'm the matriarch of the me's of course and they all look to me for protection right. and i've also agreed to honor them and love them and not let anyone hurt them yes it's a very it seems surreal but it really works for me yeah first of all thank you for sharing that with me this feels like sacred ground <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And all of them. Yeah. <laughs> you all know my secret yeah. now. Well, this is my actually, couch, this my is a brave couch. woman I'm sitting with. <laughs> a really brave woman and a wise woman. Um, I love this. And so there's an entire branch of um, psychotherapeutic practice that's all around the inner child. Mm. And for those of us who have, do, who have done inner child work, what you realize is that there are inner children. It's not a child. There are so many parts of the self. So one of the ways, and I'll jump on this um, on this topic because I love it so much. One of the ways that I had to understand. Maybe sweaty. Yeah, all right. <laughs> huge risk. I got real warm there. Yeah. Anyway, go well on. done. Sorry. Well done. I'll probably break a sweat here in a second. Um, <laughs> so brave. Uh, so I was looking at um, the parts of me. And there are three eras of my life that um, seem to be pretty um, significant. And all of the other children that I know I have inside sort of come in these three chapters, so to speak. But there's the six-year-old Vanessa, the 16-year-old, and then the 24-year-old. And the six-year-old is just a sprite. She's the most playful, pure, um, loving, affectionate child. And she was also sexually abused. And so she can't make any sense of that whatsoever. And I'm speaking in third person, but it's me. Sure. Um, but she, she, she has no idea what's going on. She only knows that certain, sometimes she can't feel anything from her neck down, right? And then there's the 16-year-old me who is the churning emotional artist. And I love her. You know, she sat on the floor of her bedroom in high school listening to the Indigo Girls crying. You know, <laughs> she's, she's that, like, a churning, beautiful, creative energy in me. And then the 24-year-old in me uh, is the New Yorker. And I don't want to stereotype people who live in New York, but when I lived in New York, the walls I had around me were high and thick for a reason. I've got a very tender heart. And in order to function in that environment, which honestly in a lot of ways felt exactly like my family of origin, mm -hmm. very achievement oriented, not a lot of emotional care, um, I developed a personality that was harsh, um, haughty at times, conceited at times, just gross. I mean, I look at that and I'm like, oh, Vanessa, I can't believe you have to admit this. But then when I look at her and I think... My God, you had to survive a lot that happened to you when you were re really little. And when you combine that much trauma and then an emphasis on achievement, mm. you have a very haughty young woman. It's just the way it turned out. So I had rejected that part of me for so long because I didn't like her. And when I finally spent time with her and listened to her talk... And I had journal entries where I just let her talk. Mm. Yeah. That's powerful. Yes, it really was. And when you journal with your inner child, the little one, use your other hand. Non-dominant journaling will trigger the parts of your brain um, and stimulate them that are not really developed yet. And you might be able to get to some truth there. But when I was journaling and letting 24-year-old 20 Vanessa talk, what I eventually figured out 
is she basically said to me one day, you know what, Mom? I know you hate me, but I'm her watchdog. That's right. You mess with that little one, and I will take your face off. So I had this, like, aggression in me. And I didn't know what to do with it. It kept coming out in conflict. It's coming out in relationships. I'm like, oh, God, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so ashamed. I mean, people rejected me. People left me for this. And I, I couldn't help but kind of agree with them. I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is, like, way too strong. And there were those friends who have stuck by me through thick and thin, and I'm grateful for them. But when I eventually saw what her function was in me, two things happened. More than that, but two things that I'll say today. I developed so much respect for her and love for her. I think she's a badass. And the aggression dissipated. And so... Because you become partners. Yes. And because you can't hate anything away. It doesn't work. Mm -mm. The path of transformation is the path of self-love. I hate to be kind of absolute about things, but I'm going to be a little bit absolute about this. I know that's an oxymoron, but I'm going to do it. The path of transformation is a path of self-love. You cannot hate or shame anything out of your body. You have to love it. Because it's there, period, right? It's, just, it's there for a reason, Yeah. right? It's functional. Right. Um, I was teaching a class on emotional health a few years ago, and I remember the collective groan from the audience when I said this, but I said it, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it 10 years from now, I think. There is no such thing as a rational emotion. That does not exist. Now, there are appropriate and inappropriate reactions and responses in the moment based on what we feel. But there's no such thing as a rational emotion. So when we look at our partners, our friends, our parents, whoever we look at, and we hopefully don't, but if we level this accusation, like, you're being irrational. No, they're not. Something in them got triggered that's connected to a wound. And whatever they are feeling actually makes sense if you know their story. <gasps> if you do not know their story, then you'll look at them and say, well, you're behaving irrationally. Mm -hmm. But if you actually know someone's story, you look at them and you say, what you're doing makes total sense. And I don't like it. I don't feel close to you right now. But what you're doing makes sense, given who you are. And God, that's that so lived. good. Yeah. So powerful. So good. But it's true. I only bring to the table all of my experience. Right. I can have empathy. I might have intellectual understanding. Mm -hmm. But I, I can't truly know you in that way. You That's know? exactly right. And there's an existential loneliness in that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that... There's a proverb, actually, in the Bible that I really like, and I'm going to butcher it, but it says something to I the butcher Bible of, passages all the time on this show. Let's butcher them together. <laughs> um, you know, they're old. They can the idea, the they'll, idea they'll last. is there. I think the idea is there. That's <laughs> well, the important thing. That's right. And the idea is um, no one can really, truly share in a man's uh, uh, rejoicing, and no one can share in his sorrows. Mm, that's exactly right. That's exactly it. Yeah. Right? And so, but here's the cool thing about... Um, love and the therapeutic relationship and I do tell my clients that I love them and some you know clinicians would be aghast but I think that's why they're coming in they want an experience of being loved for exactly who they are and I don't have a problem telling my clients that I love them and they know that I do and I do well in all honesty listening to you speak on that panel I was like oh this is a damn good therapist I've, mm, I've been to I many a therapist so. but I was like <laughs> you can just there's just a Mm. And probably because you experienced your own pain yeah, and got through you. the other side. Thank you. Someone wrote me a letter recently that I really, really appreciated. And she wrote something to the effect of um, your, your love is born out of anguish. Mm. And that word anguish just stood out to me. And when she wrote it and I read it, I thought, yes. And there's that recognition. If I'm sitting in your office and I'm unearthing my archaeology and yes beautifully said. and and I, i'm looking at you and you're there th i can see that you really understand mm -hmm. you may not be me and mm -hmm. i may not be you but there's a for somebody who's experienced it and not only experienced it but but touched it and dealt with it mm -hmm. and you know and it's always a process of becoming and unbecoming mm -hmm. which is what we are mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. that i think that creates a safety of course. Yeah. And I have also been um, unsafe 
in the therapeutic room. In fact, I had, uh, I knew I was coming here to do this this Saturday and I had a session earlier this week and I asked my client if I could mention this um, because I think it's important to say for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I love the name of this podcast, Hey Human, and I am a human and I screw up all the time. Thank you, and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know that we're sitting with fellow humans. Um, and the other thing is, um, I think it's important for people to understand the nature of therapy, that therapy is at its core a relationship. It's an exchange of energy and self. And two thoughts, and then I'll come back to that story um, that I have permission to share. Um, the first thought is, the cool thing about love is that if I see the world as you, I can't love you. Because then I'm really just loving myself, right? And so there's this unspoken egocentrism that we all live in that says, well, I'm only getting to know you because I just want to see if you're like me. Mm. We don't consciously think this. Mm. But we do interact this way. Like, oh, I've seen that movie. Well, we get very excited when you're like me. It's a (laughs) trap. Exactly. We talk about that all the time. Yes. And I I love your thoughts about that, actually. I've been listening to some of the podcasts coming <laughs> up to this. Yeah, I really enjoy them. I, think, I think this is a great podcast. Um, so, but if, but if I see you as different, truly different, like, man, I don't feel that space in my own body that you're expressing right now. This gives me an amazing opportunity to really love you. Not because you're like me, but because you're you. Mm, mm-hmm. that's the whole point mm-hmm. right because if I think that you only love me in the ways that I'm like you and you're like me that doesn't scratch the itch I want to know that I'm actually unique that you're not me and that you still see value and I see value in you and we actually love that that's right? something I think about a lot the idea that to love someone it's easy to love someone for all the things you like about them it's not as easy to love some one for all the things you don't like about them. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's it. And this is where the story becomes extremely important. Because if I simply love the things about you, this is mirroring, and it's a very important part of relationship, right? Mm -hmm. That I'm showing you who you are, and you're showing me who I am, and Mm -hmm. that's a really beautiful thing. And we're doing this right now with each other. Like, we've had eye contact now for quite a while, and it's really beautiful, and I'm enjoying it. And, right? <laughs> I feel like it burns, it burns, it burns. <laughs> oh, the immediacy of intimacy. Oh, you know. um, but yeah, it's been really lovely. Like, you know, I'm, I'm nervous a little bit. And so when I've noticed my nerves come up a little bit, I take a breath and I come right back to your eyes. Mm. And that's the way that I've stayed really grounded with you. Yeah. Because whatever anybody's opinion of this is will be their own. But... I want to connect with you, Susan. Right. And that's what's important to me, right? Far more important than people's opinion. Um, see, now I got into, your, like, looking at your eyes and I completely... They're beautiful, are they They not? are gorgeous. <laughs> my mom is from Colombia. Susan, your eyes are absolutely so gorgeous. gorgeous. So these are like my sausage. goodness. She's so tall and so gorgeous. <laughs> my mom all the time. Um, <laughs> the nature of love, loving what is different, right? Yes. When we start to get curious, and I have done this wrong more often than I have done this right in my life, because I will form judgments, right? I will make assumptions. Mm. I will use this body of knowledge that I've collected in my head for 41 years, and I will, okay, I know what I'm working with, but I don't. What I have to do is actually stay with my body, stay with the curiosity and go, okay, here's what's coming up right now. Here's how I feel about it. It's different than me. I feel a little bit uncomfortable. Tell me more about that. That's where growth happens. I mean, this is what frustrates me the most about humanity is that Mm. we, we look to what is sameness because that feels comfy and, and yeah. we're like, oh, I can love you because you're like me, like you were saying. Mm-hmm. But in my understanding of who I am, I don't get there until I see what I'm not. Yeah. And so if I'm looking at you and you're all the things I'm not, I can be like, oh, okay, this is really fascinating. I'm not any of those things. How would I ever know that unless sure. I s- take the time? Sure. Which is, again, on this podcast, why I talk to people who I don't agree with, who I'm nothing like. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say the scale is tipped more just because I, I reach out to people who I'm not like and who or whatever. And I think they're like, oh, scary. I don't want to talk to that <laughs> weirdo liberal freak show, you know, whatever. But 
<laughs> but for me, I, I, I love it. Yeah. How do we know who we are until we don't know who we aren't? Sure. I think that was a double negative, but you get the no, idea. No, I totally yeah. get it. I mean, sort of, you know, another way of saying that, and it's a different um, sort of category of human experience, but, you know, we don't really know who we are until you've lived far away from home. Mm. And it's that in relationship. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have to get far away from the home that is me to really know who I am. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and I will share a story that, again, happened recently, and she told me I could, um, about when I did this wrong. Um, I had a client come in in the last week, and she shared an experience that she had. Um, and it's an experience that I'm actually very familiar with. She, um, I'll leave it at that. And she had a different experience of it than I did. Of course she did. She's not me. When I heard her talk about it, it sounded negative, and I immediately felt defensive because the experience that she was referencing has actually been a really healing thing for me. It would be like if I have some really huge, important yoga practice, and I'm like, oh, you should try yoga, and somebody came back and said, yeah, that sucked. You know, it, and it was even more personal than that, and so I felt defensive, and this was a couple of weeks ago, and she felt that. She's extremely intuitive, and she felt the energy, and I was really trying to work through it in this session by trying to be curious but my defense mechanisms fell you as therapist place. me as therapist okay yes, got it. absolutely yeah and so she came in and here's where the beauty of a therapeutic relationship is she felt safe enough to bring it to me to explore it with me and as soon as she said Vanessa I feel like you were defensive Immediately in my body, I knew I was. I was. Oh no, I'm caught. I'm supposed to be this neutral, safe place. And I wasn't. Oh my God, you're being a human being. Hey, human, right? Like I'm being a human, right? So I have this momentary struggle inside of me. Okay, do I make this about her own experience of me as the therapist or why do I just admit it and be broken in front of her? And a lot of people will hide behind their role. Well, tell me more about that. You know, there's a time for that. There's also a time to be a human being and go, I was defensive and I blew it and I'm sorry. And I did. And I immediately felt shame. And mm -hmm. I was getting ready for her rejection and abandonment. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was big. I mean, I was like, look, I, I really feel like I failed you in that moment. And if you feel like I am not the right therapist for you, I will completely understand, but this was kind of a big mistake. And of course, in my mind, it's enormous. And she was like, what? No. Oh, I totally forgive you. Thank you for saying that. And I said, well, here's what's important. You felt something in your body, and I want you to trust what you feel. And you felt it with me. And if it means that I'm going to admit this to your face and kind of just wear this shit on my face, yeah. you know, I'm going to because your healing matters more than my ego right now. And everything in my ego wants to explore this with you and not take responsibility. But the human in me says, admit it and validate the hell out of her. And I did. And I walked out of there and she left. And the session ended, it was my last session of the day and I just went over to my desk and I stood there for a minute and I was like, well, you know, the conversations we have with ourselves, I'm like, sister, that wasn't your best moment in therapy, but you know what? Your integrity is intact march on mm -hmm. and that was it and that you bring up such an important point is that no matter i mean I'm, i can't even tell you how many years of therapy it's been a lot of therapy for me and uh i still have my foibles i still forget i still trip over my own feet of course because i'm a human being yes you know and and i think you also bring up a good point is that when you're in partnership whether it's friends family lovers whatever that that you you know when you're having those moments if you're capable and a lot of people aren't of course they're just not there yet but mm -hmm. if you can say like i'm having this moment mm -hmm. it's really hard i don't know what it means or i don't know what i'm feeling or whatever mm -hmm. for the other person to be able to say okay i get that like mm -hmm. be in your moment and everything yeah. it's like that that moment of humanity sure the ego is very powerful though oh yeah oh fucker <laughs> <laughs> that's right um yeah and the ego 
you know, there's lots of ways to conceptualize the ego in, in this work and in this field. But one of the ways that we understand the ego, or that I understand the ego, is the, the ego is a bit of a watchdog. I yeah. mean, the ego is it's protecting, protecting us. Yeah. yeah, it's protecting us from the shame of our brokenness. Like the 24-year-old you that's Absolutely. haughty and whatever. Sure. When you were talking about that, it made me think mm -hmm. of um, multiple personality disorder, right? <laughs> no, but no, yes. so our DID, they call it now, yeah, right? Sure, so yeah. I was seeing, isn't it interesting that there are two ways to deal with trauma. There is the DID where the brain actually splits into different people and mm -hmm. each of those people take over to mm -hmm. protect the core personality. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. in most of us, it's the other thing, mm -hmm. right? Where we, in this moment, we're gonna be kind of an asshole. In this mm -hmm. moment, we're smarter than you. In yep. this moment, we're, we it. talk baby talk. That's it. In this moment, we cry at the dumbest stuff, you know, yep. whatever. And it's, to me, that's fascinating because we all have multiple personalities. Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> One's just happening very internally and creating these really em e evolved and involved yes. people. Yes. And the other is just... Fluid, a little bit more fluid. Yeah. yeah but well, it is so interesting to me. It's, it's fascinating. Same. I completely agree with you. And the goal of all of those scenarios is integration. Mm. Mm-hmm. Whether and and really, what would dis, what would distinguish someone with what we call DID? And I'm not big on diagnoses. I think we talked about this on the panel discussion. Yeah, and I, I want to talk about that. More. I yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. Sure, we can so. come back to that. Um, what we would call someone with DID is dissociative, right? So when the personalities emerge, there's not a consciousness of them, and when they um, retreat, there's not a memory. Mm. Okay, that's at the very heart of a dissociation is a loss of memory, right? Um, over here, I can say, wow, I was really acting like the 24-year-old or the baby in me came out and, you know, I've been known to, you know, break into baby talk myself when I need to feel small and I want you to protect me, right? Mm -hmm. So the goal is always integration. The goal is always to, and I love this, to build yourself a sofa and put your people on it. Mm-hmm. And pass the popcorn. Mm -hmm. Because whether or not someone is conscious of the dissociation or unconscious of the dissociation, we're dissociated. We're fragmenting. That may have been trauma. It may just be the world we live in. It's hard to be a whole person, right? Mm. But to put all of these precious, precious parts on a sofa and give them some popcorn and say, hey, guys, I got you. Yeah. I got you. Um, diagnoses. So yeah, on the yeah. panel, you there was something that I had written down in the journal that I was keeping in that moment that mm -hmm. said, um, I believe that you said the pathology of emotion. And I thought, ooh, I'm writing that down. I want to know more about that. So can we dig into that a little? Yeah, let's dig into that. Um, we pathologize emotion. Uh, a lot of what brings people to therapy is they're, they're feeling really strong emotion they don't know why, they don't know what's happening, and they're worried about it. So the actual emotion itself is causing anxiety. Mm. Okay, now we're worried about being emotional. And what some of the work of therapy is, is, you know, the fancy name for this is normalizing, but it's exactly what it sounds like. You just have to create some normalcy here. Like, this is normal. You are functioning normally for someone who has been through what you've been through with your personality and your history and your story. Like, you're normal. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just responding mm -hmm. to your environment. So we create a space where we're not going to look at our emotions and the intensity and the strength of what we feel um, and be worried about it. We're actually going to look at the emotions and the strength and the intensity of what we feel and the length of the emotion, however long it lasts, with curiosity and acceptance that these are normal emotions. This is how emotions go. Sorrow is typically a slower emotion, right? When we feel sorrow, we're grieving. Something that's been uh, sorrow is the indication that something that we love or value has been lost. Okay, that's the, that's what sadness is. What do you mean by a slower emotion? Uh, meaning it drags out. Mm -mm. Um, we typically don't feel really sad, and then we're over it, right? Anger, conversely, is if it's true anger, it's actually a very fast emotion. It's powerful. It's intense. We get hot under the collar. But if you can just wait it out without reacting, um, it'll pass. Um, emotions sort of have their own shelf life. Part of what we have to grow into are human beings who can tolerate them and love ourselves in them and through them and wait them out. Um, 
grief recently has been a theme in my life. And I was doing some writing about it. And the way that I described grief was a glacier carving out a riverbed mm. that will bring a new stream of water. But the carving is slow and cold and difficult. So I'm waiting it out, trusting the process. And I do have a faith in a higher power, so trusting God mm. that if I wait, there will be new life. Everything dies before it comes back to life. I trust that. It's the way of the universe. I didn't invent it. I'm part of it. I trust it. Mm -hmm. I'm living in that truth. So when we're in those places, um, the dark night of the soul, the struggle, the valley, we wait, we breathe, we talk, we find joy, and we wait and it will pass. So why don't I pathologize emotion? How could I? It just means you're alive. I'm not gonna pathologize you being an alive human being, but I will be with you in it. I'll go down there with you and I'll sit in the hell of your world because I've been in mine. Hmm. How, as a therapist, when you are dealing with someone, do you know then the difference? Because there is, of course, mental illness that is a chemical thing, right? Do you believe in that? Hmm. And it's okay if you don't. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I historically, this is what we're taught. Don't see the science. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah, because you talked about exercise actually creating a mm -hmm. world within the brain that that. Yeah, what, what I was referencing there were the Duke Smile Studies, mm -hmm. 1999, mm -hmm. and um, what they showed in those studies is that exercise is as effective as sertraline, which is what we call Prozac, for relieving depression 30 minutes a day. I believe it was three times a week, or may, it might have been every day, but it was 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise. It wasn't weight training. And then what they found is the long-term studies, the people that used exercise and not the drug had less relapse. Some did, but it was less. Um, I have seen medication do wonderful things in the sense that if someone is in acute pain and not functional, the medication will, what I call, kind of pull up the bottom. And if they're bottoming out and the depression is that severe and the anxiety is that severe that they really can't like get a hold on everyday activities, they can't function at their work, they can't function with their families, they can't function in themselves, medication is going to kind of pull up the bottom. The problem is, is that it also brings down the top. So we lose, if, if emotion is happening on a spectrum, way over here on the left we have despair, hopelessness. Way over here on the right we have ecstasy, bliss. What your typical antidepressant is going to do is kind of pull everything toward the middle so that we lose the despair. Okay, we're not feeling that either, but we lose our ability to feel ecstasy, bliss, hopefulness, right? So we're sort of living in a, in a mid-range and we lose, we lose um, the outer emotions. Now, again, in extreme cases where functionality um, is impaired, we need that. We need to kind of bring it in, regroup, process whatever happened, okay? And let's see what happens. If someone feels that medication is right for them for their entire life, I sit in zero judgment of that. But I will say over the time that I've been in practice, I have seen many, 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 many clients come off medication. And what I hear is I feel like I can feel my feelings now. I feel like I can manage what's coming up inside me. I've seen clients come off medication and then go back on. I've seen clients not come off medication. All of it works. Mm. It's an individual choice, but the science around this whole notion that there's a chemical imbalance in the brain, it's just not strong. It's not there. No one's seen it. No mm. one can prove that. Well, no one can barely understand how the brain works, period. We've only exactly. scratched the surface there. That's so. right. So what I tell people is, you know, because my... I'm asked frequently, you know, should I get on medication? Should I not? I'm like, it's total personal 
it's a total personal decision, but here's what we know. If you do, it's going to blunt the emotions that will lead us home. Mm -hmm. Home is your true self. There's a wound here. And there was a, a covering that got put over that true self. So whatever you're feeling, that's our roadmap. It's just so painful. Yeah. Right? So if I really ask you to get into the depths of your depression... And I use a, um, a technique called brain spotting. That's a, it's, a, it's a trauma technique to really sort of bypass the prefrontal cortex, which is the thinking part of the brain where the ego sits, and get into the midbrain and the reptilian brain, which is all where that trauma and that emotion is sitting, right? It's so painful. It's scary to go into those places. And sometimes knowing that I'll go with you and I'll help you come out is not enough. I mean, sometimes people will say, I can't do that. I can't go there. Okay. I honor that. There's a block. We're going to honor the block. Those are all your sentinels. Those are all your interior guards who are saying it's not safe yet. It's not safe yet. You're not ready yet. We don't trust her enough yet. And what I tell people is I will earn your trust and I will do that for as long as it takes. And mm -hmm. wherever you get with me in that process will be exactly where you're supposed to be. So there's an honoring of limitation, of decision, of resistance, of medication. There's an honoring of all of the ways that we survive. Yeah. So I don't sit in any judgment of it, but we do know that it will blunt the emotion and the emotion is actually what we need to feel to heal. Mm -hmm. So. And medicating emotion, I suppose, is one of those absolutes that people turn to. Oh, this will fix you. Take this pill. Sure. When it's just putting the Band-Aid on, it doesn't do anything for the cut. That's right. Yeah. It's symptom management, which is what medi medicine is. I mean, it depends on the kind of medicine one practices, but a lot of medicine nowadays is symptom management. We've lost the sense of personal accountability and responsibility for our health. We make all kinds of stupid decisions, then we have the body reacts, and then we take pills. Um, in the case of mental health, often we didn't make dumb decisions. Things happened to us, again, in the vulnerability of being a child, and then it's on us as adults to decide what we're going to do with that. How do we function in that? Mm -hmm. What do we bring to our relationships as a result of that? Um, what I have talked about a lot is what stands at the very cornerstone, the very crux of mental health is personal accountability. It's knowing that this is your choice. And now, neural pathways or not, you are in a cycle of choices. And we can look at ourselves and we can hold both, which is a dialectic, right? We hold two seemingly comp opposing truths. We say, well, I'm kind of enslaved to the neural pathways that are inside of me, and I have total choice. Both are true. Both are true. The choice is I have to interrupt this if it's not healthy. I've got to interrupt the neural pathway, interrupt the habit if it's not healthy. And there are many ways to do that. Um, can something as simple as if in the morning I grab my phone and look at it, and then, and so tomorrow when I get up, I will do 10 deep knee bends or mm -hmm. something different than mm -hmm. what I normally do. Or I'll brush, as you were saying, mm -hmm. from the opposite side. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll floss first. Yeah. Are those, will those aid in getting to that pain or to that place? Or are they just, mm -hmm. do you know what I'm trying to say? I do. I, the, I if you're already, if you're building, if you're living your life in the same pattern, day yeah. in, day out, yeah. and you have this pain that you're managing, however you manage it, yeah. by disrupting this tiny area mm -hmm. of your mind, mm -hmm. by creating a new pathway, by mm -hmm. doing something different mm -hmm. in the morning or at night or whatever, mm -hmm. will it come back over here and touch that thing you're trying to protect to let it open up a little? Or I don't know if I'm explaining what I'm I, trying to say. I right. think I understand you, and I love the question. Here's what I see in that question. The, the the thought that came to mind, Susan, as you asked that, was I wanted to just say everything works. <laughs> everything works. And the reason why is because there's a willingness and a desire. This is what the ancients teach us. If you knock, it will be opened. If you seek, you will find. If you ask, it will be given to you. If what you are trying to touch is pain. And so I'm going to brush my teeth differently this morning. Does that work? Hell yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. 
Yeah. Hell yeah. Because, because you've willingness given permission. and desire. Mm-hmm. That's right. You're opening a path inside mm-hmm. you and saying, okay, I don't know what's down there, but I'm willing. It's like the everything. butterfly effect. Yeah. With brushing your teeth. I love sure. that. Everything works. Now, as we, and this is, this is the slower part of the process, right? Before I was um, a therapist, I put myself through grad, grad school uh, being a personal trainer. So, yeah, I've been helping people transform all kinds of things for years. It's lots of fun. And I loved being a trainer. And what I used to tell people as a trainer constantly is you have to increase your tolerance for pain. Came up all the time. If you are going to get into really good physical shape, you have to increase your tolerance for pain. Now, let's talk about healthy pain and unhealthy pain. And I use the body a lot, probably because I was a trainer, but also because people have a better sense of their physical body than they do their internal world. The internal world is sort of murky and it's supposed to be. It's a mystery. But what I would tell people is there's good pain and there's bad pain. Good pain is, whoo, I can feel myself really working right now. Bad pain is if you feel anything in a joint, you tell me right away. If anything feels like it's pulling, tell me right away. And if you have physical pain, if it gets up above a two or a three on a scale of one to ten, stop and let's talk about it. Okay? The same is true emotionally. All right, we have to develop the emotional muscles to do deep work. When people come to therapy, often they are in a lot of pain. That's why they're in therapy. That's why they've sought out a therapist. And so what the beginning stages of therapy is, is earning trust. Um, The fancy word for that is developing the therapeutic rapport. But really it's earning trust, okay? It's them feeling safer and safer in the room, hopefully. And then you've you've gotta learn their story and kind of find out what are the building blocks here, where'd you come from, tell me about your family, blah, 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 mental health history, all that stuff. And then we have to start developing an emotional vocabulary, right? Just like when a little baby is developing, like, where's your nose? You point to the nose. Where's the eye? They point to the eye. Where are the lips, right? And parents, oh, they know where their nose and their eyes are. Unfortunately, we don't get that emotionally, right? Kids don't usually get like, hey, I think you're feeling really sad right now, or I think you feel embarrassed. Are you feeling afraid? Like, we don't have an emotional vocabulary. We just come into adulthood and we've got these huge, robust hearts and no way to talk about what the hell is going on, right? So that's a lot of what beginning stages of therapy is, is developing your emotional awareness and your vocabulary. And that's where a lot of resistance is because we're starting to touch the wounds, Mm -hmm. okay? Once people are willing, and this is where that courage comes in of like, okay, I want to heal this. I'm going to brush my teeth a different way. Once people become willing to talk about their emotions, once they sort of buy in that, like, this is an important part of you, it's really important, like, this is an entire stream of information about who you are, is your emotional life, they start to develop muscle in therapy, and the therapy gets deeper. We still hit the roadblocks. I mean, humans are mysteries, so there's always going to be that, like, wow, we're both stumped. What's going on here? This is so interesting, and blah, 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 you know. But what they've developed is endurance, emotional fitness. I'm a runner, right? I think I mentioned this at the, pot, uh, at the panel discussion. I remember when I couldn't run for 10 seconds and I can remember the first time I ran seven miles. Endurance is endurance. We need mental endurance. We need emotional endurance. We need spiritual endurance. And we need physical endurance. And the longer people are living in sort of a holistic, integrated way of being with themselves, the more they develop endurance in all of these areas. So what we have, and we're all doing this in different er- in, in different areas. There are some parts of me that are extremely emotionally resilient. And then there are some parts of me that are emotionally I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. I'm like, you're going to have to really slow down what you're saying right now because this part of me emotionally is about four. (laughs) You know, this part of me emotionally way over here is 41. This part is probably about six months. Will you hold me? (laughs) Right. But knowing those parts of the self, right? Mm -hmm. And knowing that like, okay, this part's developing. So I'm going to be really careful around this part of me right now because this is where my soul is a child. This part of me can take a little bit more, mm-hmm. you know, the analogy between physical fitness and mental, emotional fitness seems to resonate in this way. Yeah. And on, I mean, I'll go for months at a time working out and then I might fall off it for a couple of weeks and I'm so hard on myself mm-hmm. in those two weeks. And I think, God, I need to get to the gym. And then I make excuses like, well, I do go up and down the stairs a lot. And, oh, I didn't do this. So that's yeah. kind of exercise. And all yeah. that. But it's weird how we, how human beings do that to ourselves. You know, we don't even, 
give ourselves slack. And I think about yeah. that and, and liken it to like when you go to a therapist and you really want to lie to them. You know, I've been in a therapy session where the therapist has said, he asked me a question and I'm just, mm -hmm. either I don't actually know the answer mm -hmm. at, or I give an answer and then after I say it, I'm like, that wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> That. You know what I mean? Yeah, I love and that. I have friends who have been in therapy <laughs> where like, well, I don't really tell my therapist that or that. I'm like, what are you doing? You have to tell them this. You know, you yeah. have to tell them this. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a saying in AA that I like a lot, and I'm a big 12-step fan. Um, but there's a saying in AA that says you're only as sick as your secrets. Mm. And the secrets are where the shame is, and the shame just keeps us locked down. Um, so I have found a whole lot of freedom in working the 12 steps myself. Um, are you sober? I am not an alcoholic, um, although I come from a long line of people who have medicated their emotions with substances. Um, the 12-step program that I found, um, sort of sent by my therapist, but I'm grateful for it, is Adult Children of Alcoholics, mm, ACA. Yes, of course, sure, sure. And it's alcoholics, but it's also just adult children of dysfunctional families, and it's exactly what we're talking about, that in certain situations when we're triggered, we basically become a child. And all of our child ways of coping and defending and protecting are in full force. And so, again, the goal is not to just, you know, love my inner child and let her rule the world. It's to reparent her with love, humor, and respect. Mm -hmm. Which is what, if there's a trauma, if there's a wound, that's what, that's what was missing. It is interesting because all of us on the couch, when I, I'm mm -hmm. faced with certain things that, in as an adult, Susan... And something happens, and I'm like, and I can see the the sort of rumblings amongst the couch, like the monster suit me. Yeah, it's like, do I need to step in here? And it's like, no, no, I'm supposed to have you. <laughs> I've got your back. I'm fine. Thank you, it. because that yes. that that would have been the the default. Yes, and there's the self honor. There's the self honor. Is I'm not going to shame you. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to hide you. I'm just going to say. Thank you, mm. but I got this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Elizabeth like, Gilbert talks about that mm. in uh, A Big Magic, where she says, mm. you know, we, back in the day when we, the predators and the people were neck and neck, yeah. um, you needed your fear to keep you alive. Of course. You needed your fear because it said, hey, there's a lion stalking you right now. Yeah might want to take care of that and yeah. now if you're let's say you want to write a book and you sit down at the, the computer and you start writing and your fear shows up you can turn and and i'm paraphrasing her you know sure. but you can turn to the fear and say thank you for protecting me when we had lions yeah this isn't a lion it's just a book yeah and i don't i don't i appreciate your existence yeah and that's the other thing that i've thought a lot about is that I do believe that all these things, anger, jealousy, fear, sadness, <clears throat> joy, just like people want to be heard, mm -hmm. our feelings, our emotions want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so where we get into trouble and end up in clock towers and things with, you know, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. machine guns, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is that something shows up and we shove it down and we don't listen. And so yeah. I joke and I say, oh, yeah. I like to to take my shadow for coffee you know <laughs> i had an experience yeah. you know i'm a musician and, yeah. and, a, and and all that stuff and um i think i've brought this up on the show before but mm -hmm. i had this moment where friends of mine who i adore were having this moment and getting an accolade and uh i felt myself i felt jealousy come up sure. and yeah. i was like whoa because suddenly the jealousy voice was bigger than the i love these people voice mm -hmm. and so I was sitting there in this audience, and I was like, well, hello there. And I had the conversation. I was like, mm -hmm. why are you here? What's going on? Sure. Where, that, where, where is it. this coming from? Yeah, that's and, beautiful. And then together, mm -hmm. we kind of did the walk backwards yeah. to find one of God, my God, when you're a little kid, jealousy comes up a lot, right? Yeah. Especially if you have siblings and all that stuff. So we went backwards, and, yeah. and jealousy, it's like that Ebenezer Scrooge with the ghosts of Christmas, past, present, and future pointing at yes. the, the moment and yes. you're like okay well that makes sense and I appreciate they're here and it's like that thing with Elizabeth Gilbert yeah. talking about fear where you go Josie I totally get it and yeah. yeah you totally it totally makes sense why you're jealous right now yeah. I get it yeah. and the minute you look at the emotion in the face and you say I love you I get you 
but you're not necessary right now. It's okay. Mm-hmm. You can yep. go That's about right. your merry way. It goes yep. and it vanishes. That's right. That's and it's right. so powerful. Yeah, that's exactly right. Of course, then you're sitting in the audience like crying for this moment. Of it's like, oh, you're crying for your friends. You're like, no, I'm crying because I'm an asshole. You know? like, <laughs> because I just talked myself through something. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if your entire audience heard nothing else we've talked about but that story right there that you just described about your own jealousy, that's the whole point. You just did it. That's it. That's everything. Is the relationship with the self that is curious, accepting, validating, and also has boundaries. If you can do that with and in yourself, you'll be able to do that with anybody. The reason why we reject and hate one another is because we reject and hate ourselves. But you've just, you've just cured humanity, Susan. I mean, that's it. Like, there it is. You just did that. You, you did. Thank God. Well, you did. I mean, here we are on a Saturday. But yes, you just did. You have a part in that healing story a huge part, and there's a moment of it, is I looked at myself and I did not hate myself. I did not shame myself. I was curious about myself, but I also have boundaries with myself. Like, what does jealousy do? Jealousy speaking to the emotion of feeling inadequate. Mm -hmm. That's what it's doing. If I have that, I'll feel more full and I'll be better. Okay, well, thank you. You know what? We can't be and have everything in life. (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) Little jealous part of me. We can't be and have everything in life. And so can you stop wanting and can you be grateful right now? Can you be content? But thank you for showing up and thank you for desiring. Mm. Right? We can Mm -hmm. we can glory in our desire, but we can desire for things that really matter and really last rather than the things we see around us that we think will make us happy. Right. So there's so many parts of that that are really good and human, like you desire. Well, good. That means you're alive and you feel jealous. Well, I mean, there's all kinds of intellectual functions going on around comparison and measuring that are actually really sophisticated and cool. This is just an outpouring of them that's unpleasant. Mm. But all of those intellectual functions are important, necessary and cool. Mm. Right. So there's so many ways that we could validate this. It's just your own experience of yourself. If we cast judgment on it, like, oh, I feel jealous. I'm such a bad person. What I tell people in therapy is like, you know, let's stay away from words like good and bad, because if we do that, we've put a huge roadblock in front of us that says there's nowhere else to go. There's nothing beyond this. You're just bad. Well, how boring. You're so much more interesting than that. So let's move this sign aside and say, "Ooh, you're interesting. Let's go further. We don't have to judge it. We don't have to place any values on emotions. Now, do we place values on behaviors? Yes, and we need to. If we didn't, we'd be sociopaths, right? We need consciences. We need to know. Wait, I'm not a sociopath? That's good news. Well, I I hate to disappoint you. That's a really interesting personality structure, but no. (laughs) I'm like, I'm probably one part sociopath. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure we all are in our moments of failure of empathy. You know, that's just a drop of sociopath there in the mix. But, um... Yeah, I mean, I think that's everything right there. It's the relationship with the self. And if you have a relationship with yourself that's loving and humorous and accepting, you'll be able to do that with everybody around you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, maybe even 100% of the time, although I'll give myself some slack. I certainly do not do that. Well, that's the spiritual journey, right? Sure. It's growing in love. I think it surprises people, especially listening to this podcast, because I do talk about religion quite a lot mm-hmm. and spiritual and people's relationship with mm-hmm. a higher power or not. Mm-hmm. And I, I've, you know, run into people on the street, as it were, who mm-hmm. are like, oh, wait, you be- you believe in a higher power? I'm like, yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Well, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And uh, it surprises people because I often talk about how religion can mm-hmm. become a drug or uh, you oh, know, sure. or, and all that stuff. And, it's like anything else. Yeah. And I think that's important to talk about any of this stuff is uh, it's okay to see the other side of things. Mm-hmm. You know, even yourself. Oh, yeah, you better. Yeah. So I recently had um, part of the grief that I worked through over the last few months brought me face to face with my shadow. Woohoo! <laughs> That's a party and a half in it. Yeah. Um, And I will tell you, on the other side of the work, I love her. I love her. I love her. I love her. And I needed to go through what I went through to love her. And this is where faith matters. Because if we have some sort of faith 
that there is life after death. And I don't mean the afterlife after we physically die. I mean when part of us dies, when a relationship dies, when a job dies, when a dream dies. If we can stay with the process of death and grieve and get buried in it. In the Christian tradition, we would say there is resurrection. But there is resurrection and life after death in every tradition we know of. It's a universal truth. So even science, because one hundred percent, because the seedling that comes yes. to the tree, then the tree dies, and that's then right. it create, you know, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's straight out of you know the Gospels. Unless a, if a kernel of seed falls to the ground, you know, unless it dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it bears fruit, and blah 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 blah. So these universal truths are actually true, and if we can get into that place where we're trusting. Um, and, you know, the type of therapy that I do is at its heart called pastoral therapy, but it has nothing to do with being a pastor nor serving pastors, although I have counseled pastors. Um, it has to do with sort of the care of the soul. So it's a very holistic model of therapy. Um, I'm looking at the story on numerous levels, right? What is their spiritual story, their sexual story, their intellectual story, their emotional story, their cultural story, but what I don't leave out is the spiritual story because it's too important. It's at, like sitting at the very core of who we are is who we believe we are in the world, mm. right? So what my understanding of humans is whether or not they call themselves deist or Christian, it's almost irrelevant. They are in this story. They are in this energy that we're calling a human experience and we're calling life. And they have a place in it and they're partaking and um, participating in the energy of it. The question is at what level of conscious awareness? Mm. That's really the question. How aware are you of how you're moving through the world? Mm how energy is affecting you, what mm -hmm. energy you're putting out, mm -hmm. what energy was imposed on you, right? All of that gets into sort of a different layer of understanding and being, but I think that's where faith is. You know, that we can't see this, but there's no denying it. There's no denying it. And even atheists have a faith. It's just sure. a faith in no God or a faith in science or... Yeah, look, everyone has a higher power. It's whatever directs your thoughts. It's whatever. Yeah. It's whatever you think is better, wiser. Yeah. Than you. Yeah. Right. Everyone has a higher power. Everyone submits to something. Mm -hmm. um, I hope every day that I submit and surrender to love. Mm. Mm -hmm. That I can continually be aware of how my ego which promotes self, again, out of self-protection and sometimes out of just, you know, pride. Uh, I hope every day that I can continue to make a choice to surrender to love, whatever that looks like, because it looks like a million different things. Mm. Amen. Yeah, I could talk amen. to you for hours, honestly. I'd love to start digging into shadow, but maybe you can come on the show again and we could talk about shadow. I'd love it. Yeah. Because I think that's a huge conversation it's in huge. and of itself yeah. and a fascinating one. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. Tell people how to, to find you. Okay. And um, do you do um, therapy online and stuff? A lot of therapists do that, but I don't nope. know. Nope. Okay. I don't. I need a person-to-person -person interaction. Okay. Um, and if you start with me in person, sometimes we'll move to a Skype situation if you're out of town or if you move away. But that way I have a relationship with you first. Mm. Um, I'm old school that way. Mm -hmm. So I you're need, in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. The website is castironcounseling.com. Cast iron like your cast iron pan and cast iron counseling is the end of it. Why did you um, choose that name? I find that intriguing. Yeah. You know, I've thought about it for so many years. I kind of cho chose it because it felt right. And then I've sort of lived into it. Um, the, the words on the website, the language is um, as iron is basically poured into a fire and bent by heat. Mm. We arise from the struggles we face. Mm. So there's this, this, this understanding that bend with it grow from it and then eventually you grow a lot stronger um and also and this is sort of a, a later r revelation um all of my cultural well most of my cultural roots are mediterranean and cast iron is such a huge part of that architecture and that aesthetic and it has moved me for years i mean it can bring me to tears it's just so beautiful to me to see like a beautiful iron gate um for those who are nerding out um the eiffel tower is cast iron 
which is really, is it really? Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I like looked up cast iron and did all this work on it before I built my website. But yeah, that's why there was this idea that we are transformed by what happens to us and what the heat that we get into and to go with it and be transformed by the fire. Dig it. Mm-hmm. Dig it. So that's the website. And yeah, um, I'm here in Nashville. I would love to do another. I mean, I could sit here and talk with you all day. I mean, long. hours. <laughs> yeah. For real. Yeah. It can do yeah. spirits for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you so very much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Thank you for listening. Bye.